Beautiful morning, isn't it? Just a great day. Uh, Trudy and I, uh, my wife and I, were in Pinehurst, North Carolina, and I was there to candidate to become the next senior pastor for the church. And so there was a, an evening event uh, in uh, one of the search team's home, home and uh, uh, the search team and their spouses and Trudy and I were there. The evening went very, very well. And as the evening came to a close, we were standing and chatting in the foyer saying goodbye. And there was the husband of one of the search team members who came to me. And we were in the heart of ACC basketball country. And so he came up to me and he says, uh, he knew that I love basketball. And he said, so Dean, are you a Duke guy or are you a Carolina Tar Heel guy? And I said, boy, Jeff, I said, that's a hard question. I, I love good basketball, and these are great coaches. I, I really like both teams. I don't think I can decide. He says, you have to. You have to choose. And I said, man, that's really tough. I'm not sure I can. He says, you have to choose. And so I said, well, I guess I've probably seen Duke on national television more often, and Krzyzewski is a legend, so I guess if you're going to force me, I'll go with Duke. He looked at me and he said, wrong answer, and walked out. I, and I didn't know if he was joking or what. I n did not know the guy at all. Well, we lived in Piners for three months before I realized that indeed that was true. If you're living there, you could not be a Duke fan and a Carolina Tar Heel fan. You had to choose one or the other. Here's my question today. Can a man be a giant killer and also a writer of poetry? Is it possible to be a man's man and yet to be gentle and sensitive? Can a man be an elk hunter in the morning and then write about that experience in his journal that evening? Can a man's wardrobe include camouflage and pink polo shirts? That's what we're talking about today. Now, our society, in my estimation, has moved into a very dangerous place in regards to sexuality. Here are some of the things that are going on. There's a term that is called gender dysphoria. It's a condition where a person experiences discomfort or distress because there's a mismatch between their biological sex and their gender identity. The APA has drafted new guidelines for psychological practices with men and boys that have said that traditional masculinity is harmful. Traditional masculinity, guys, is harmful. And according to the guidelines, uh, this traditional masculinity constrains men's behavior. It, it results in gender role conflict, and it negatively influences mental and physical health. Well, Mattel Toys also wanted to get into uh, this fracas, and so in 2019, they issued a gender-neutral doll. So it's a very, very confusing time uh, to be either male or female. And I see no uh, hope for the future for it to settle down. And that is why it is absolutely critical that whether we are male or female, that we ground our identity in the Word of God that is above all of society and above all of culture. And because we're doing a study in the life of King David, um, my focus today is going to be upon men and masculinity. And because our approach in this series has been to look at various themes in his life, we are going to be visiting and revisiting several different passages and highlighting different things from these same passages. So I begin today, men, we must build our masculinity upon the Word of God. And I believe that, that David can be a good model for us as we think about this subject. So we're going to begin today with that testosterone-filled category called a giant killer. 
So in 1 Samuel 17, we know the story of Goliath. David comes to the Hebrew camp early uh, that morning, and as he is there, he hears Goliath mocking God, and he also uh, sees him taunting these terrified Hebrew soldiers. And as David hears Goliath, the testosterone begins to flow in David's veins. Now, as we looked at this story a couple of weeks ago, we said this, that there are things that should stir our passion. There are things for which we should move off the bleachers and into the playing field. God's glory, God's reputation is one of those. Our spouses and our families is another one. But when we see injustice, when we see something that is clearly wrong, that should cause us to be stirred in our spirit. And as a result of that, we answer the challenge. Now, David has been answering the challenge even before he met Goliath. It started with the, the bear and the lion, and of course now it's a giant. And so here what I want to understand today, Holy Spirit-filled masculinity answers the challenge. It, it does not wilt or fade. It doesn't cower in, in fear. You see, a man's nature, it's part of our testosterone, a man's nature is to respond to a challenge. However, when you have the Spirit of God living inside you as a man, what happens is that as you grow in Christ, the Spirit of God is going to shape the things over which you become passionate. So that what's going to happen is that the things that are of great concern to God will become things that are of great concern to you, and your passion will be stirred. So that the Spirit of God working with your testosterone comes together and you speak out about things that really matter. Now, the term activist is, is a term that is very controversial today. It, it sometimes denotes violence and, and vandalism. It's unfortunate because in a very real sense, in this story, in 1 Samuel 17, David becomes an activist. He, he answers the challenge, and his actions are such that he kills Goliath and cuts off his head. Now, as a result of that behavior, we're told in verse 51 that the Philistines saw what had happened. Their hero was dead, and they turned and ran. And the men of Israel and Judah surged forward with a shout, and they pursued the Philistines to the entrance of Gath. And they engaged in a great battle that day. You see, David's activism, stirred by that Holy Spirit-filled challenge, caused a great victory to be won that day. And so David literally is a giant killer. But there's another significant story in his life that's important as well. In 1 Chronicles 11, beginning with verse 10, and all the way down to chapter 12 and verse 40, we have a list of David's mighty men. And in verse 10 of chapter 11, there is this description uh, at the very beginning before it lists them. Now, these are the chiefs of David's mighty men who gave him strong support in his kingdom, together with all Israel, to make him king according to the word of the Lord concerning Israel. And so then we begin to go down here and you see the list of these men and some of their great exploits. David's masculinity inspired other men to become brave and courageous. They joined David, and as they saw David's example of what Holy Spirit-filled masculinity was like, they said, I can do that. What's so interesting, of course, is that these men were there in the kingdom during the days of Saul. But they cowered in fear following their leader, King Saul. But when David appeared and gave them a, a different model to follow, suddenly 
courageous, brave, mighty men came out of the woodwork to join David in this great experience. Healthy masculinity releases masculinity in another generation. Guys, that's what happens. When you model healthy masculinity, you demonstrate what it can look like. You model it, and it releases masculinity, healthy masculinity, in your sons and in a whole other generation. And then we come to 2 Samuel chapter 3, and we have a description of David's achievements, his accomplishments as the king of Israel. And so this is what it says in uh, 336. And all the people took notice of it, and it pleased them as everything that the king, David, did pleased all the people. Now, that was a commentary, or we might say that was the Gallup poll <laughs> in David's day. I mean, just think about what is said. Can you imagine a Gallup poll releasing uh, the, the, the results of the poll of a sitting president today with these words? Everything that our president did pleased all the people. Impossible. But David did it. He consolidated the 12 tribes of Israel. He defeated the number one threat in Israel, which were the Philistines. He established a new capital in Jerusalem. He brought the ark to Jerusalem. He expanded the boundaries of the country tenfold, and he reigned for 40 years. Indeed, everything that he did pleased all the people all the time. So here's what I want us to learn about this particular passage. Healthy masculinity uses power for the good of others. If you're in an influential position, uh, a powerful position, uh, whether it's in the home or at work, if you have a lot of physical strength, guys, to be a man's man, you use power and influence for the good of others. You do not use it selfishly upon yourself. You never use it abusively in words or physical or emotional abuse, but rather you use your power and your influence to serve, to give, and to sacrifice for others. That's what it means to be a manly man. You do it in your relationships, and you also do it in your organization if you're an employee. You use your power, you use your influence for the good of others, not for yourself. So David is a, a manly man, and yet there's so much more to him than just having the testosterone flow through his veins. He was also the writer of poetry. He wrote 73 of our 150 psalms. Now, his writings then were included in a genre of the Old Testament that is called poetry. So here we have a giant killer who wrote poetry. In 1 Samuel 16 and verse 17, we, we learn that he was quite a musician so that when this evil spirit uh, uh, came upon Saul, this is how... Uh, David is described. Saul's servant said to him, Behold, now a harmful spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is skillful in playing the lyre. And when the harmful spirit from God is upon you, he will play it and you will be well. So Saul said to his servants, provide for me a man who can play well and bring him to me. That, of course, was David. So he is a musician. He also was a composer of hymns for the nation of Israel. And even it's speculated that he was a creator and inventor of musical instruments. So, so this is a man who is very, very creative. I believe that a healthy Holy Spirit, masculinity, provides breathing space for creativity. In other words, can you be a man's man and appreciate the arts? Absolutely. Painting 
and writing, uh, drawing. I mean, there's just a lot of things to appreciate in, in, in the creative world. David was an example of that. You know, today we watch uh, professional football players, and they are walking testosterone dispensers, are they not? I mean, just hawks. And yet it's interesting to hear some of these players speak because they talk about the creative game plan, the creative plays that their coaches have invented, discovered, created. What, what's the word? The point is that they are being creative in their game plan. It's, it's very significant to think about the creativity that is used in some of these macho, testosterone-filled sports. Uh, much discussion today, much, uh, much to be learned about being left brain or right brain. Well, David seems to be using both sides of his brain very, very well. We also learned about David that his EQ, his emotional intelligence, was very high so that in the Psalms we have his journal that he wrote. And he's very expressive in there. We're going to quickly go through a couple of these verses so that in Psalm 13 and verse 1, he wrote this in his journal. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? So here's a man who writes in his journal that he feels abandoned by God. That's a little bit unusual for a man to write that. Guys, have you ever been in a men's group and hear another man say this? It's in Psalm 42. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for God. My soul thirsts for God. My tears have been my food day and night. Ever heard a man say that in your men's group? David said it. How about this one in Psalm 51? an entire psalm in which David confesses his sin, talks about his mistakes, Psalm 51 and Psalm 32. He says, have mercy upon me, God, according to your unfailing love, according to your compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. So David is, is quite humble as he is ultimately confronted and acknowledges his sinful behavior. In Psalm 55, we have another entry into his journal. He said, my heart is in anguish within me. My fear and trembling has beset me. Horror has overwhelmed me. This guy's afraid. And so what does he say? Oh, that I had the wings of a dove. I would fly away and be at rest. He wants to run. He is so afraid. And of course, the story of Goliath tells us that he didn't run. But that does not mean that a man does not experience real fear and wants to run away. And then finally in Psalm 63, a couple of great verses for us. He says, I've seen you in the sanctuary and I beheld your power and your glory because your love is better than life. My lips will glorify you. In other words, real men sing in church. Real men sing in church. I will praise you as long as I live and in your name I will lift up my hands. Real men raise their hands in worship. David did. So here we have giant killer who writes poetry. And finally, there is this intimate friendship that he has with Jonathan. So that after Jonathan died, David said that our love surpasses the love of women. How beautiful it was. Now let's just put to rest that to be a man today means that you are living an isolated life without friends and that you're the featured star on Alaskan Survivor television show. That's just not all that there is today to be a healthy masculine man. See, healthy masculinity truly enjoys close, intimate friendships. So we see these two sides of David which are so beautiful. And yet, of course, we have a couple of episodes of great failure in David's life. Sin with Bathsheba, you know, too much testosterone flowing through his veins. And later on, the pride that causes him to number uh, the, the troops ignores godly counsel. And so his pride gets the better of him. And so we, we realize that, that David had flaws. 
just as we have flaws, and how much we need the grace of God. Oh, we need the grace of God. Now, I can't talk about being a man without recognizing three chemical and biological differences between a male and a female. And one of those is testosterone. So here's how one man describes testosterone. It is what makes a man a man. Testosterone makes men aggressive and more apt to take risks. It causes their legendary interest in sex and sparks their drive for independence. It's associated with dominance, physicality, and high esteem. Guys, we've got a lot of testosterone. Wives, your husband has a lot of testosterone, and that's part of the way he is. He cannot change that. It's part of him being a man. Here's the second difference. It's called the amygdala. Uh, The amygdala is a tiny feature at the base of the brain. It is in the middle of the hypothalamus. And for a man, the amygdala is larger than it is for a female. So let's talk about the amygdala. Here's how one man describes it. The amygdala never forgets a fearful moment, which is why traumatized people often find it so difficult to get over their hair-raising experiences. Think PTSD. The amygdala can only respond to what is in its memory bank. It does not think or reason. Did you get that? It does not think or reason. And it continues, it emits an irrational chemical an electrical response that may save your life in an emergency, but it can also precipitate violence and make matters much worse. This explains a man's fight or flight impulse. That's helpful to understand that this is what we're dealing with, uh, with this amygdala, this irrational response, this, this, this chemical uh, that is released within us. We need to understand that as men. And finally, uh, there is what is called the corpus callosum. These are bundles of fiber that connect the right and the left sides of the brain. And they control the traffic between the brain's two hemispheres. The male's corpus callosum is much smaller than a female's, meaning that there is 30% at least less connection of those hemispheres. Guys, what that means is this. Your left and right brain, the, the, you know, the, the communication that occurs, it's like a, a, a country two-lane road, while your spouse's is a major interstate freeway. And so there's radical differences between the brain. Here's how one man expresses the differences between a male and a female's brain. Are, are very unique. Men's brains are made up of little boxes. And we have a box for everything. We've got a box for the car. We've got a box for the money. We've got a box for the job. We've got a box for you. We've got a box for the kids. We've got a box for your mother somewhere in the basement. We got, <laughs> we got, we, we got boxes everywhere. And, and the rule is... The boxes don't touch. (laughs) When a man discusses a particular subject, we go to that particular box, we pull that box out, we open the box, we discuss only what is in that box. All right? And and, and then we close the box and put it away being very, very careful not to touch any other boxes. (laughs) Now, women's brains are very, very different from men's brains. Women's brains are made up of a big ball of wire. (laughs) And everything is connected to everything. 
and the money's connected to the car, and the car's connected to your job, and your kids are connected to your mother, and everything's connected to everything. And it was like... And that's why we have marital conflict. It's just as simple as that. Now, there are significant biological and chemical differences between a male and a female. We need to understand that. It's part of the beauty of God's creating of us. Now, guys, speaking to myself, when we got testosterone, we got this large amygdala, and then we got this corpus copalum thing, callosum thing. That does not give us the freedom to be jerks. Never gives us the freedom to be jerks. What it does tell us, however, is that the Spirit of God, when it's active in your life, that the Spirit of God addresses those issues and He brings those chemical and biological differences under the power of the Spirit of God. So, being a Holy Spirit-filled man, I think, occurs in this way. Looking just at David's life from the Psalms that he wrote, Justin earlier did this beautiful song from Psalm 139. I was not familiar with that. Really, it was a great song. Here's what David said in verses 23 and 24 of Psalm 139. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me, know my anxious thoughts. See if there be any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Guys, the first thing we do is that we invite the Spirit of God to search our hearts and to reveal to us those things that are below the surface, that are somehow impacting our walk with Christ and our testimony within our families. Invite God to search your heart and to know your ways. That's the first thing to do. A second thing to do is in Psalm 86 and verse 11, where David again says, Teach me your way, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. Another translation says, Unite my heart to fear thee. Guys, if we're honest, we would admit that every morning in our hearts a battle rages. A, a battle to walk with God and to love others or a battle to, to just be selfish and, and to be concerned about ourselves. We struggle with that. And, and David acknowledges that. He says, God, I want an undivided heart. Would you unite my heart and its devotion to you and the devotion to my wife and to my children? Ask that. And number three from Psalm 119, also penned by David, he says, how can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your word, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And he says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. And, of course, we all think of Awana, don't we? What a great, great verse that is, to lay the word of God in our hearts. That would be the third thing to do. Say, Lord, get, may your word live in me in such a way that by the power of the Spirit, I live in harmony with what the Scriptures teach. These three things come from the, the pen of David, worthwhile for us to consider. Dads, your sons need you to be a healthy, spirit-filled man. You need to teach them that masculinity does not lead to macho, but it leads to to manhood and make sure that you distinguish for them the difference between macho and being a man to be brave and courageous to be a man of purpose and protection but a man who is also sensitive giving and sacrificial for the sake of others that's what it means to be a healthy man guys if you've got daughters Care for them in such a way that when they get to that age when they're dating and when they're looking for a spouse, that they would not settle for anyone less than what they saw in how you treated them as a daughter. 
If you're a father of teens, I want you to know that something happens in a child's life about the age of 12. It has been said that those first 12 years, the mother is crucial, dad is there, helpful, but bottom line is that the children oftentimes identify more with their mother in the first 12 years of life, but when they turn 12 or 13, it's like dad becomes front and center. And studies have shown how significant is the data about a dad who is deeply engaged in the life of his teenager, physically, mentally, academically, and I would say even spiritually. The studies are there. Men, you have to engage deeply in your children, and especially as they go through these teenage years. Did it in the first service, going to do it again here. I'm going to ask all of our men to stand. Would you stand? Teenage boys and young boys, I want you to stand too. Yeah. It's good to see so many men here that you're not ashamed to come to church and to say, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. This is good. I see grandfathers, I see fathers, I see single men, I see teenage boys, I see young boys. So beautiful. I want to pray for all of you. Let's do that. Lord, thank you for the grandpas, perhaps great grandpas who are here, for the legacy, Lord, of their lives for how they've lived and and walked with you for so many, many years. May, Lord, this be a season in which they truly see your faithfulness in the next generation of their family tree. Lord, I think of the men who are fathers here, who, who are right in the thick of balancing work demands, family demands, spousal demands, trying to keep in shape, trying to manage so many Uh, balls that are in the air. God, I pray that you would assist them to, to make good decisions so that, Lord, they would be able to model for their sons and daughters what it means to be a healthy, spirit filled man in today's confused society. God, I pray for our single men and for uh, the, the young adults, the, 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 the men who, Lord, are perhaps looking for a mate. At this point in time, you've not yet brought one into their lives. Lord, how do they control some of those testosterone urges? I I pray, God, that they they would find you to be sufficient for them. God, care for them and and help them, Lord, to, to live healthy, productive lives, Lord, with the temptations that they face. I pray for these young boys, Lord, that they would grow up in such a way that they would learn that masculinity is not about macho, but it is about being a man. Lord, thank you that there are so many strong, godly men at Highland Community Church. It's a strong legacy. And God, I pray that in the months and the years ahead, that in this deeply, deeply confusing time that there would not be any fear of any man saying that not only am I a human being, but I'm a man. May they not shrink back from that because, Lord, they have built their masculinity upon what is taught in the Word of God. And so, Thanks for these men. Thanks for the moms and the wives who support them. And Lord, thank you for this good day to be with your people in your house, worshiping you, hearing and responding to your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Enjoy a beautiful, sunny Sunday. You are dismissed.